Good afternoon. So, anybody? Is it okay? So my name is Harpreet. I work for uh, McKinsey. I'm a senior architect. Uh, my talk would be uh, about sharing experience. I'm sorry for the spelling mistake platform. I mean, uh, the, the whole thing just got done yesterday night. I was not supposed to speak at this conference. Uh, I spoke at uh, one conference in the morning, if anybody uh, is aware about the CSIR initiative. So government is planning for next five year uh, big data rollout. And I'm, I wrote my PhD with CSIR, so uh, so my background is I am a B.Tech uh, Electronics Communication Engineer from Villa Institute. Then I did my Master's, two Master's from University of Wisconsin uh, in Electrical Engineering and Biomedical Engineering. I wrote my PhD with uh, CSIR. I am uh, with McKenzie as a Senior Architect responsible for Big Data Projects. What I will be sharing today uh, would be uh, use cases uh, about uh, uh, some of the applications which have been done. Uh, using Hadoop ecosystem. Since I, I mean, Harshad and I spoke only two days back about this conference, so I have, uh, you know, he told me this this session is more about uh, uh, trying to educate people on, on what's happening, more uh, senior architects, uh, technical guys, uh, uh, and, and this uh, same presentation I used for uh, National Symposium for Big Data along with Vikas. So I have not done many changes. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. Intent is, uh, highlight three case stories of uh, how big data is getting consumed. Uh, I am an enterprise architect from background and uh, how a big data component fits into uh, the complete AI layer. That will be one of the things I will be talking about. More Java oriented, <coughs> although the, the solutions had uh, Objective-C as well as the .NET components, so, but I will keep it more onto the Java space. So how big data fits into overall business uh, solution and how the cloud, EAI and Hadoop ecosystem interplay. Uh, intent is to uh, use medical data for building clinical decision support. Data is data, so uh, don't think it's, it's medical has to do anything. I mean, uh, I've worked as an architect for uh, uh, Intuit, which was a financial software company. I founded Oxiant, uh, which uh, whose product got acquired by Philips, uh, again, uh, in, in, as a single processing company. So uh, data is data. I mean, as an architect, it doesn't change that much. So uh, don't try to read all the content. Uh, and very simply, uh, largest pharma company, uh, they used to be our customers. Uh, uh, and we uh, used to take care of all IT applications for them. And uh, one day they called uh, that we, we want to, uh, you know, we get 150 chemicals, which we try and then get one drug out of it. So uh, our biggest showstopper as a generic pharma company is that uh, it takes us six to nine months to test the chemical on 50 organs of, of a human body to report that the chemical doesn't have any toxic effects. So uh, the problem is very simple that uh, each image which microscope produces at 40x resolution is uh, uh, 2 gig, 3 gig. And the FDA recommended guideline says that you have to do minimum 40x and you can go up to 100x. So uh, roughly, uh, if you do uh, properly any uh, slide uh, automatically, it, you're dealing with somewhere between 4 gig to 6 gig image. Uh, no contextual information, uh, no uh, uh, free text uh, game available. So uh, the problem is that uh, one clinical site uh, will do at least 400 images in, in one scan. So uh, one clinical site generally produces 400 into 6 gig and most big pharma companies who are really uh, decent size um, and generally pharma companies are very big so uh, we'll have 20 to 25 clinical sites so you are talking about uh, terabytes to petabyte data every day and they wanted to have a resolution uh, of 10 minutes per image uh, which the reason was very simple if they give it to a pathologist whom they are paying 15,000, 25,000 rupees uh, he looks at that image on a microscope and goes through all the tiles in 15 minutes. So uh, they asked us, can computer do the same thing for us? And uh, you know, as an engineer, uh, and, and since customer was willing to pay, we said, yeah, why not? So, <laughs> so problem was, uh, I mean, being an electronics engineer, it helped, but uh, frankly, uh, it was like stretching to the limits because uh, 
image analysis can be very tricky. So a problem is simple. Uh, Leica and uh, other companies, my my last company, Philips, generate all these uh, uh, images, which uh, I'm only showing H and E image over here, which is pink and blue. So uh, these images have uh, some areas, some uh, uh, things which appear in black, and their uh, numbers in a given area defines you know whether the the cell is normal or abnormal. So it's it's very simple. Uh, like Manoj was uh, talking, if uh, you have some text and, and some uh, something appear, appearing in a context, and it, it's appearing more than the uh, threshold, it's abnormal versus uh, if it's within the given range, it's normal. So for us, uh, we had to uh, ensure what pathologist has learned in the last 30 years, our system can learn, and as a decision support system, can we can say and predict that uh, the same result can be given by uh, the solution. The architecture, uh, what we actually, uh, I mean, this, this was over a period of time, so uh, uh, some of the pieces are not like, uh, they appear easy now, but uh, so we started uh, building the rich client based GUI system because uh, the first challenge for us was uh, most of the GUI solution which works on 32 bit machine can handle up to 2 gig image. Java is not supposed to handle more than 32 gig uh, unless it's a 64 bit uh, solution. So when we started the project in 2008-9 time frame, uh, our uh, first uh, area was, okay, build an RCP solution which does very similar to Google Maps, Ajax uh, kind of uh, network uh, uh, logic so that the 6 GB image is not 6 GB on the client but only 100 MB. What user is seeing and then based on this panning, zooming, all kind of annotation examples, you know, we can move the image intelligently. <coughs> that was uh, our first year job and then uh, once we had the image under control and we were able to uh, have a guy in Belgium and guy in Badoda, uh, because uh, pharma companies are, uh, they have presence in, in, in Gujarat. So the guy sitting in Badoda dealing with a guy in Belgium, interacting in the night with a guy in US, they can share the annotations and they can share what decisions they have taken. Uh, and, and so still manual, no, or no automation done. So, uh, so they can at least make a workflow and a decision support on top of it. Once we were able to get the uh, environment, the client environment installed, a uh, second challenge was can we handle the image at that scale? And that's how we got introduced uh, with Hadoop at that point of time. So we started with 0 0.20 version and slowly you know, we kept on increasing our knowledge as Hadoop grew. So uh, what we uh, decided internally as a team was that Hadoop was efficient for us as a data storage. We were able to store images on Hadoop and use the HDFS. Uh, more. Uh, like concepts of distribution and, and uh, passing uh, images to data nodes and name node and, and uh, those procedures. But MapReduce to us was not uh, the efficient way of uh, making that solution because uh, we, we also had some PhDs in the team who were experts in uh, GP GPUs. So most of our image analytics uh, solution, all the uh, cleaning up of the image, uh, you know, converting into grayscale, finding out the neighbors, finding out the objects, all was done in, in GPGPU, C, C, C++, wrapped into uh, Java through Jcuda. And uh, so we used uh, all the image analysis part in, in that. And uh, although we tried to uh, use the MapReduce as a, as a batch processing thing so that we get the parallel, parallel processing of Hadoop, uh, but it was more that uh, Hadoop takes a big 6 GB divide into multiple tiles, each tile going to an individual data node or multiple tiles going to an individual data node and then at that point, you know, getting work done from GPUs and, and, and uh, solving the problem as fast as possible. We also at, at later stage uh, integrated uh, something very similar to uh, what Manoj showed uh, uh, as Elasticsearch, something called Druid. So Druid is uh, also a, a, a big data, I mean Hadoop based uh, uh, data search uh, technique, all open source Java uh, coming from a company called Meta Markets. Uh, I, I could not, you know, all the things when I was seeing face sets, percolation, I was like, it, it's all, uh, Druid also has very similar kind of stuff. So uh, you, you guys can have a look at that solution. Uh, for all uh, uh, machine learning kind of uh, solutioning, we used uh, Apache Mahout um, and, and a team which is currently working and, and uh, building on top of it because uh, we uh, uh, 
handled 50 organs. So, uh, I, and in my stint, we handled the first six most critical organs, like uh, uh, liver, kidney, sex organs. And then there were some other organs which were not uh, that interesting, where we know the toxic effects are not uh, that critical. So, uh, our approach in the project was, uh, uh, we build the domain knowledge uh, uh, with the pathologist. I mean, I don't like the green color, it's just I use the, uh, uh, the PPT and put my slides into it. So, uh, uh, the domain knowledge is coming from the pathologist and asking them what they see in the image. So, they, they sh told us like, uh, we see that if the nucleus are not circular, there is some abnormality. If the, if, if the nucleus count in a given area is more than a specific threshold, that's for us abnormality. So, we took uh, having rigorous meetings with them on each organ multiple times, building that knowledge uh, was our first area and that's very critical for any, uh, when you're solving a big data enterprise solution, you need to have your domain knowledge, be it in retail, be it in sales forecasting, be it in, in the pharma business, you need to have your domain knowledge because that's what you will be doing it through your automated uh, map reduce or uh, other solutions which you will be building. So any data which we you get, you first need to pre-process data, uh, remove the noise, uh, find your, uh, so in, in our uh, problem, uh, I will just move to this slide, in our problem, uh, that's not that good. we had to identify certain regions in this image. So you can uh, basically, you know, this is a pink blue image, which is appearing a bit weird on the scanner, on the projector. So uh, the, you can simply do a color deconvolution. Uh, which means like you can take uh, the image and divide into two colors or n number of colors. So if you are only interested in pink color or blue color, then you can only take that. So you basically divide and conquer in, in data space. So you don't handle the whole data uh, together. You uh, say that, okay, I will identify some features in pink space. I will identify some features in, in, in black space. If there are features which are not color dependent, then you go to a grayscale black and white and you can identify over there. So, uh, we basically did some pre-processing, pre identify our areas of interest and, and whatever results we were getting put into machine learning uh, so that uh, once our training set is ready, which is validated by our domain experts, which we go back and say, sir, this is what you are saying, this is what our system is getting. For unknown data, we can uh, you know, go back to the doctor and, and doctor can validate, yeah, you are getting more closer to us, the, the, our way of identifying the thing. To ensure that our logic and the domain uh, expertise is handled in, in one more uh, way because uh, our uh, mentor on the project, uh, he advised us to have third arm as a, as a supporting uh, you know, conclusion uh, that if this is saying 77% yeah, accuracy and the domain guy is also saying yeah, this looks good to me, there is at least one more arm which is saying, yeah, yeah this is also 80% or 60% accurate, so we can validate. So that approach, we actually, instead of getting into, uh, since this approach was heavy on machine learning, we took this approach purely on uh, if-else logic. Very similar to, if my number of objects are greater than 10, if my objects are of this shape, I'm going to do this. So this was heavy on rule engine. So very similar to percolation, but we actually built our own rule engine uh, from ground up which can handle thousands of if conditions and, and their uh, interrelationships. So, uh, just to give some flavor how uh, things work, uh, so we use, uh, if any one of you is trying to do image analysis on Hadoop, uh, there is an API called HIPI, which is, uh, I think, from University of Maryland, if I'm correct. So, uh, they, uh, these guys uh, have done a lot of things, a uh, lo lot of, uh, <coughs> job queuing, uh, different packages in terms of image identification, image analysis, how to handle uh, an image into a data node uh, structure. So a lot of uh, Hadoop based uh, things they had handled. And uh, there is another uh, Java project, uh, ImageJ, which is heavily used in uh, image uh, analysis. So we combined these two things and uh, wrote our own custom map reduce task. And whatever segment was time consuming, we pushed that to CUDA to, to leverage the fastest uh, time optimization. Because uh, simply you can always consider that whatever runs in 
30, uh, CUDA is always 30 times faster, even if you are using the cheapest uh, uh, local uh, processing power. So GPUs are nothing but, uh, you can say, uh, 30 or 40 CPUs together doing uh, a similar kind of task. But they are limited by the uh, matrix multiplication power. They don't have the functional uh, uh, capabilities. So we uh, took whatever was our mathematics and image processing, that portion we moved into CUDA. And we used, uh, uh, as I said, Hadoop as a uh, storage and as a batch uh, division, and CUDA as a processing engine. Any questions? There was no map reduce used. There was map reduce used, but map reduce was more to uh, take a, so our image was SCN image. So take an SCN image, generate tiles, and then, you know, those tiles, you, you let's say one image contains this image is concept of tile is that this image as 6 GB will never be 6 GB uh, uh, stored by a scanner. No, nobody can handle 6 GB. So uh, what they do is they divide into multiple square regions and each square region is called tile. So uh, then tiles are numbered and you know the neighbors. So uh, your map reduce will, your mapper task will take an image and identify how many tiles you have and you will write your own uh, file input formats. So uh, which means you want to control the number of map tasks you want to start uh, for a 1000 tile image, 1000 map task. So instead of using uh, default text uh, line by line input formats, you want to uh, ensure that, let's say, uh, my uh, smallest object is uh, of this size, which fits into minimum four tiles. So I want to make sure that I have a four uh, tile uh, and, and I'm sliding both horizontally and vertically. So based on my approach, I will uh, generate my map task to generate that data. But the data analysis of, a uh, lot of people have a perception that Hadoop is fast. Hadoop is, is not used for speed. Hadoop is used for parallel processing. You can't target that big data. So Hadoop will just divide into small chunks for you. And those chunks you can, uh, you, you can still use your traditional techniques. You know, maybe R is fastest for you, maybe Perl is fastest for you. But to divide and rule that data, you use Hadoop. So uh, our maps were just generating that data, which was then processed by uh, CUDA. CUDA is more towards the image processing? It's just uh, mathematics, multiplication. So CUDA is uh, heavily used, uh, irrespective of image processing, anywhere where you have more uh, uh, you know, uh, floating point operations. So that's where you use uh, GPUs. Like all Macs have, all the visualization is handled by GPUs. So GPUs are, because for the visual display, what you are pre presenting on the uh, screen is all matrices. So anywhere where you have matrix and you are doing multiplication, so if you are uh, calculating for a company a recommendation for a given product, but you have to choose between one million product, and you have your recommendation matrix multiplied by your user history matrix, it might take uh, five uh, seconds on a CPU and you want a millisecond acu uh, time uh, response, you can convert without uh, rewriting the whole thing, just put that calculation onto CUDA and it will make you 30 times uh, faster. So it's purely uh, for doing mathematics faster. I have one more question. Sure. It's related to image processing yeah. rather than the data. So this image and EP are providing the image processing like as detection and kind of things or they are like the processing units? So HIPI uh, is basically a library to, uh, when you use Hadoop, you have a, no, you understand Hadoop, right? So Hadoop has name nodes and data nodes. So when you store an image, let's say you have a JPEG image uh, or a TIFF image, multi-page TIFF image, and, and this image is 5 gig. So now uh, your block size is 64 MB on default Hadoop configuration. So how this 64 MB will be divided is not in your control. But you want uh, your neighbors to be in, in close to vicinity to you because you are doing a lot of image processing where you need to know your neighbors. So HIPI ensures that the image is divided into the format which allows the image processing to be done in an intelligent way. So HIPI is not giving you any image analytics procedure. It's only uh, taking an image and bringing it into Hadoop ecosystem. So it has a, a notion of how, based on your Hadoop configuration, you can choose some settings that it will convert this JPEG image into .hippy image. And you can choose that the whole image should be on one data node, 
or it should be scattered in this format into these many data nodes. So those configuration you have. And once you have the image back in your control, then you can use image J because image J is very extensive. Only problem is image J will not work for more than four gig image because if, if you're using two gig on an old machine or if you're using you know, 4 GB or 6 GB because it's a Java application. So it's not written as a, a high-end uh, image analytics application. It's more for the browser application. So, uh, <laughs> so if the image is divided into some parts, so the, the things or the parts, the black parts or the blue parts you are looking, if they are with the edges and divided into two parts, so, so it will be handled by AP or not? It will be handled by us. So if we will divide it, give us that metadata back, and then we will intelligently handle it on our algorithm. So HIP is not a black box for you to do image analysis. So like, uh, so maybe I, offline, I will yeah, yeah, I can share with you the codes and examples, so you can just use them. So uh, second use case, if uh, uh, this is more about uh, genomic data. I mean, uh, uh, so again, I'm not trying to teach genome. I will share a slide uh, just to uh, show you what the data is. Uh, maybe I will come to this slide afterwards. So genome is nothing but a text. So uh, every human uh, is consists of uh, genes, DNAs. I mean, we all watch science fiction movies. I mean, I'm not a biologist, so I'm also a computer engineer. So we are all uh, having something called ATGC. So ATGC are uh, four characters. So a, a genome is 3.6 billion character string, which has ATGC repeated. So uh, we have, in totality, 23 chromosomes. So uh, each chromosome is part of this 3.6 billion big character string. So in a, as a log file, if you un understand, each line is uh, consisting of uh, one chromosome, let's say 1 to 1,000 characters. Then there is a break, second chromosome, 1 to 3,000 characters then again break and then, but all these characters have ATGC. So, uh, and, and this is very interesting because even McKinsey and Google all are saying by 2025, uh, life sciences, NGS data will be the hot topic for computer engineers. So it's a lot of new platforms are coming, a lot of big data growth is happening because of genomics data. So uh, once you, you know, cross this threshold, somebody tells you what ex actually a uh, gene is, then you realize it's nothing but you handle your log file versus you handle your gene file. It's text file, nothing else. So in, intent is uh, you have, uh, uh, we, we are familiar with kilobytes, megabytes. So these uh, biologists use uh, kilobases and megabases. So number of uh, ATGC, if they become 1,000, it becomes kilobases. If they become 1,000, it becomes megabases. So they have taken the nomenclature from computer science. So we have 6 billion base pairs and since uh, chromosomes are in pair, we only need half, 3 billion. So each, so we are handling 3 billion uh, character file and the size is roughly 15 gig. So uh, so your challenge when you say you are handling 10,000 people genome, it's uh, 15 gig into 10,000. So uh, for a starting study, uh, I will uh, uh, share what we are trying. Uh, uh, we were trying to do is that 10,000 subjects across <coughs> India trying to identify uh, if, if there are some markers which can predict whether they are healthy or they are not healthy. So for that we have we were looking at their genome and we were looking at some other uh, medical jargon stuff. But it was simply looking at each object is 10 gig to 30 gig and 10,000 of those. So for that we needed a platform which is which can handle multi-dimensional data which can uh, have an analysis pipeline. Uh, we all say Big data is about Vs, you know, volume, velocity, variability. Every individual is different, so there's a lot of variability. Uh, 10 GB is interesting size, so there's volume. And uh, uh, all other Vs, you know, will also fit in because the velocity, if, if you're doing it on a bigger population, India is like billion people, so uh, velocity will automatically come. <coughs> and uh, whether the viability is true or not, still it's under question because uh, so government is uh, uh, putting more and more money because we, we bought initially 100 terabyte thinking that's enough, but now we are reaching to a stage where even that is not uh, sufficient. So to build this platform, uh, we actually started, uh, and, uh, and this was my part of my big data thesis. So the interesting part was uh, uh, why this was important. We were trying to do more in personal uh, medicine, that 
whatever genome and objective measures, some things have uh, just screwed up uh, the notion. So whatever uh, uh, life we are living, we have uh, impact of environment, lifestyle, and diet. I mean, if we are sitting in California and we are having a weather which is different versus sitting in Delhi and enjoying the traffic we have and the kind of pollution we have, so it has a certain uh, you know impact on our life. Uh, whether we see it or we don't see it, I mean, uh, it, so the diet we are eating um, and and the kind of lifestyle or the environment we are living is impacting our current state. And uh, similarly, the the modern science ways of saying that the gene remains the same. A person is born with a DNA and it stays same. Uh, will have some uh, impact if we can objectively measure these things over a period of time, because we all are having mutations. We all are. I mean, if you watch X Men or a lot of these new movies where people are saying you you know you can do some gene changes, so those things are possible. I mean, uh, so those mutations are happening, and and the challenge is uh, finding out. Uh, so uh, again. Uh, just two more jargon words. Phenotype is uh, what is visible. So my height is a phenotype. So uh, my height, my weight, my uh, color uh, is, is a phenotype. You can measure it. And genome is something as a gene sequence. So what you can measure or directly by seeing a person, relating that to the uh, genomic objective of that person, and seeing the impact of your lifestyle on top of it, is the whole overall game of what we are trying to do. And then find if he is healthy and we know when he was healthy, what was his state, can we know what changed, why he became unhealthy. So we have created a cohort where uh, there is a space place in uh, close to Pune, Vadu, where people are kept for last three years and they are not allowed, they will stay there for uh, the next couple of years. And they are being monitored uh, on a visit by visit basis and we are getting that data and in intent is to see out of 20 to 40 years of population, what defines them as healthy and what changes when they get into an unhealthy state. So identifying that state is what we are trying to do. So it involves building, definitely handling the data is a, is a challenge, which we are doing a lot in, uh, you know, in terms of software side. One example which I am showing here is, uh, again, uh, data is data, ETL remains the same for any project, so we ingest data we get a lot of, uh, uh, these are fast few files, so now moving from image data, I'm coming to more uh, text data. So this is uh, something called fast queue. Uh, fast queue has an interesting format that they will always come as pair of four lines. So first line will be uh, some header, then will be a big text of your gene, then it will be quality header, and then again the quality parameter. So again, your typical map reduce uh, vanilla uh, environment cannot be used because map reduce formats either go line by line or they go file by file. So you have to intelligently build a mechanism where you can handle a block of four lines and identify which of those uh, block is relevant to you. So you first do, uh, uh, you know, you get this data and then you remove bad data because some of the data will not have the quality which you need because some machine problem happened or some uh, uh, read problem happened. So once you clean the data, then you identify for this person uh, in a reference genome, in, in a pure healthy worldwide person, there's a standard world standard that this genome is for healthy person. You identify those characters and see that what's changed. And you identify those changes and keep a note of those changes. So those are your mutations. and and. Uh, they can be plenty. I mean, generally you get a uh, few lakhs mutation for even a healthy person. So uh, it's, it's an evolving science. And then you do uh, a lot of recommendation. I'm not getting into the, uh, because some terms make it difficult. So recommendations are, let's say you have uh, a big character of string and then you identify that you have, uh, in this big character of string, you have sub arrays, which are your genes. So for uh, a new per individual whose genome you have done, he doesn't have a specific segment. Or he has that segment, but with few changes. And because of those few changes, his, uh, he is more prone to a sp specific disease. So those are your expression of genes. So, uh, so you've identified this big uh, sentence. Then you do a tokenizer. You identify all these tokens, which are your genes. And then you uh, identify 
the subject which you are dealing with, find out the changes and then find out what mutation he has in a healthy state and then while he is not healthy. And uh, you can also recommend based on past profile, based on your ethnicity, based on similar lifestyle, similar state. So that's the kind of recommendation, that's more personalized medicine. Any questions? Or <laughs> I'm making it too complicated. There's a term called pharmacogenomics. Yeah. Is what it's used for. Yeah, pharmacogenomics is even more complex, I mean, because then you are uh, getting into how the, uh, you know, the how drug is flowing and the chemical reactions and all those. This is still bioinformatics. This is still uh, pure computer science on top of biology data. So this information you're getting on these uh, subjects, I know what you call them, but it's been subjects. Um, is it all manual, as in you get surveys to fill the information every 15 days, 20 days, whatever you do? Yeah, so there is one portion which is manual, where a subject comes and there's a questionnaire he has to fill. And then uh, uh, there is also instruments which do a next generation sequencing. Uh, so they generate the genome, they generate a uh, lot of your, so there are 288 fields which we get, your skin color, your skin impedance, your, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder distance, your neck, there are a lot of uh, things which they measure. And, uh, 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 you know, how was your bowel movement 15 days ago and now how it is today. So, uh, you know, I find it very similar because even at McKinsey when I'm doing sales forecasting, uh, and I get a retail customer who has five years of sales data and they have, uh, you know, European backbone and US backbone and they have uh, millions of SKUs and then these many stores. Logically, oh, the recommendation is, is very similar because still you have a text file, uh, you have a unique ID and each of the SKU sale is similar to individual different, uh, you know, tests and their scores. And then you try to do a, a clustering or a classification on top of that data and, and make some, uh, we use a lot of exponential smoothing, so uh, which, which can, you can bring a lot of uh, cannibalization effect of completion and all that. So basic maths remains the same. So uh, whether you are using Hadoop for crunching that data or you are using Hadoop for crunching uh, life science data, uh, maybe the jargon, the pipeline gets changed, only difference is I will still, as an architect, use the same diagram. I will still have multi-dimensional data. Instead of this picture, I will say sales data. I will say uh, some uh, behavior data. I will still have integrated data. Instead of inter-individual variability, I will say inter-stock variability, inter-product variability. I will still have data volume. I will still have my mathematical fuzzy models to make my recommendations. So overall, this remains same. And this feedback is basically, you know, whatever we have learned, we want to, you know, improve our test. We want to come up with new devices. So uh, the reason I asked that question, actually, I was trying to get to if you guys have considered automating even data gathering, which is that environmental, a lot of environmental data could be actually automated. Right. With various sensors available today, including health parameters or or some of the behavioral aspects. So have you guys considered that? Or so that will be my third case story. Uh, which is again sponsored by government. I'm working on it right now. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, but even in industry, a lot of these wireless companies, telecom companies are coming up with these sensors and automatic data collection. Only thing is the current netizas or uh, environments of their data warehouse can't handle that data. So they are using Hadoop ecosystem or, you know, Vikas taught us Scala and Spark other day. She was using those ecosystems to handle that kind of data. So, uh, the next case story was, uh, maybe I'll just cover this and, and, sure. and share that. So, ingesting data is, uh, as I said, in, in Hadoop, you just get uh, your, uh, your uh, file system and you get that file, you, uh, you know, use put commands, get commands and, and bring that fastq file in. And since fastq file is four line, so you read the first line is always your sequence, second line is your... Uh, uh, third line is your quality header and then the quality. So uh, the in intent is again, the trick is uh, we get a 15 GB file. We first divide into individual chromosome because we can't handle such a big file. So dividing it at chromosome or you can divide that uh, file, it's, it's, it's equivalent. You can simply say I, I want to divide a 16 gig file into 16 portions versus we say okay, I want to divide 16 gig file into 23 chromosomes. Take all those files at multiple of four, take data and put like uh, one million 
blocks of four to one map task. And that map task will then do uh, your cleaning, your quality identification, those sort of things. And once you have uh, a map clean and processed, uh, created the good quality data, a reduced job uh, uses a library called Trimomatic to do the alignment of data on a standard reference uh, genome. So we use uh, again Hadoop over here for dividing and, and uh, MapReduce for uh, you know using our existing Java APIs or R APIs for handling the data. So uh, now uh, the trick is uh, you might have seen uh, uh, I think uh, you asked this question every 15, 20 days the person will be coming back. So we also have a versioning problem. So we are using Alfresco uh, for version management as a document management system. So uh, simply, you know, I mean, I was familiar with Alfresco, and uh, it's, it's a good, easy document management system. And we use Mongo as a backend, NoSQL, and Hadoop as a data crunching mechanism. So all the uh, numerical data, structured data goes into Mongo. All the unstructured data goes into Hadoop. Gets normalized. Uh, Mahout does its tricks of machine learning and the results goes back into Mungu. So this is... Uh, what is used to move this data like from its source to this, uh, like for example, Hadoop as DFS or NoSQL? So uh, what is used, I mean, uh, there are, uh, as an ecosystem, there are tra techniques like Scoop and Flume, which you can use. Uh, I use Scoop a lot because in, in McKinsey, uh, we have a lot of relational data. So when we are processing like sales data, we get 25 gigs sales data of a huge, biggest retail giant in the world and they want to generate the sales strategy for next year. So over there, when you are bringing the data from uh, a relational database, you generally use Scoop because it has all the drivers inbuilt and it can import the data. Scoop. Uh, but there are, I mean, the, the ecosystem has a lot of things. Scoop is there uh, and uh, you can uh, definitely write command line, uh, uh, I mean, if the data is on your local network, you can do, you know, uh, your get commands or uh, copy local kind of commands. So depending on what's the complexity involved, if you are using... This is one question I have, because we were assuming in our previous discussion that data is already there on a data store, and then we were working on it. Yeah, that's, that's not so correct. Whereas it was not clear, because still, like, for example, say Salesforce or NetSuite, they still may have a relational database right. and there is still a lot of data here. So I mean even you Hadoop or NoSQL is a different kind of discussion. I mean from so you have to manage both type of data. So so then I think there has to be a way to bring that data into this kind of environment which could be processed. Yeah. Uh, you are an engineer? You, you, you yeah. code? So I mean as an engineer 90% uh, uh, of job is to get environment ready and then if your environment is ready 10% of job is writing code. Right? I mean, the most difficult time is to get the Eclipse, all the plugins, syncing up with Hadoop, you know, getting the data, and, and once the environment is there, it's like typical, you know, you go to any uh, construction site, like my father builds a lot of houses, so you go to a construction site, he always says, the most difficult thing is to get Rodi, Mitti, Cement, Brotherpur, and blah, blah, blah. Once you have a nice person, nice team, then civil work goes very fast. Because you have the architecture, right? You have the raw ingredients. Then it's about volume. You you crunch it. So same is with Hadoop. Uh, the most difficult part is what has not been shown to you. It's about getting the data, cleaning the data, processing. You know, because once the data is in a normalized format, then running Mahout on top of it is not a big job. Job. I mean, it's it's a it's getting data to that situation. So when you're de dealing with the image data, I, and I simply say a Hippie does it. Hippie will not do job for you. If you will just take that file and break it into four pieces or ten pieces or my number of data nodes. The maximum strategy time as the architecture time goes into bringing into a format and ensuring that my NAS data is going into my Hadoop's data store in a proper format. And once it's there, then I can just give it back to my image analysis folks and they will do the image processing in no time. Because they know how to handle images. They will simply say, sir, I need a file image file is equal to get from wherever file. Once I have the file, I know what I have to do with the pixels and I know RGB and all that. But to get them to that API layer is generally the hardest part. Right. So uh, Even like there was an you know example of that Elasticsearch. So though in their case they were able to completely move out Mongo, 
because maybe they are not doing too much with it, they are just saving it and the data is simple enough. But, and, but in many cases the data could be more complex and these choices are not that limited that you just save the data and the only thing you do is search simple search. Yeah, I I politically I will stay away from commenting on that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, problems are always more complicated. So generally Hadoop is always in the ecosystem one small piece. You will always have your BI system, you will have your ERPs, your CRMs, and your DMS, and your C all systems, and you walk in as an architect, and there will be a mess. Because Greenfield Computing, where you say, yeah, I'm writing everything, it will be very hard. For a pharma company, they will have pharmacogenomic system, they will have pharma uh, you know, vigilance system, they will have uh, CTMS, all kind of you know, jargon. Uh, for Because uh, it's very hard to say that my system doesn't have any third party requirement, my system doesn't have to generate reports, my system doesn't have to save any text file. System have to do that. It's very hard for a production system to not touch by uh, 10 uh, you know, depending parties. So uh, uh, the in intent of uh, keeping Mongo was that we don't want it. Uh, Hadoop as a crunching mechanism. Hadoop as a storage mechanism. So you uh, generate genomic file, from Pune, you ship a CD because uh, there is no cloud. Still, the government doesn't live on cloud. Uh, these CDs come here. They put it onto uh, the cloud environment over here, which is on VMware. We have a ASX and, and number of nodes sitting on top of it. Then we have created a, a Hadoop cluster on top of it. So then we import that data locally from uh, whichever uh, DVD or CD uh, data they bring in. And it takes a lot of time for a single patient a single subject to get his genomic data, his structured data in one file and into a complete, you know, one document. Once that data is ready, the analysis is the easy part. Because, uh, but bringing that data together is still the most painful job for us. And also like, pretty much in these cases, the scenario, you have used Hadoop more as a programming model than like typical, like what we are hearing, like, you know, I mean, you have not used map reduce in the similar manner that you have a data processing method. It's just a programming model where one part is just to do the map and the second part is just to do the reduce function. I, I think I have used map and reduce for what it has been generated. I have not reduced, I have not used it for uh, purely uh, theoretical thing. Because I am an enterprise architect. I, I generated ESBs from scratch. So I have created a dependency injection platforms. I have created a complete Eclipse kind of uh, things for web, for enterprise architecture. I mean, the company Oxygen, which I founded, uh, so it does that for a living. So there are close to 150 people working. So, uh, so I mean, Hadoop is not going to solve your enterprise architecture problems. You can't use it for that. Uh, when you have an enterprise solution where you have your document management system storing your, as a bank, you have all your mortgage applications, all your OCR, OMR data stored in a certain format. You're not going to say, yeah, today Hadoop has come, just remove everything and I will write map and reduce. Nobody will do that. There are investments already in your data center. So you have to import data into Hadoop, handle, use Hadoop to crunch it, normalize it, give it back to a system, again not your production system, again as an intermediate system, and then from that interact with your production system. So that was the strategy we, we adopted because I'm the, the, the biggest pharma company of India is not going to touch me, their uh, PV system or uh, you know, any uh, system on which their live sales is happening. Uh, so, uh, and, and new technologies are seen very cautiously by CIOs and CPOs. So, uh, uh, again, we work uh, as a consultant strategist, we, we show the hype of the technology, but uh, uh, when you go and use in real life, uh, Hadoop is to handle big chunk. So, your map reduce is a paradigm to divide the, uh, the logic of application into uh, map uh, tasks, which are many and reduced are, which are less. So you uh, always 0.75 multiple of map is reduced, that's what they say, simply because there will be a guy uh, who will first gather all the information and then there will be a guy who will reduce that information. So once I get the file, I have to divide how many of those can be parallelly handled. So that's where I'm using for a genome, how many parallel files I can handle based on my node size and my uh, in infrastructure size. Because if I, uh, have an infrastructure of four virtual machines and my physical uh, uh, infrastructure doesn't have more than 16 CPUs. 
if I say each of these uh, four nodes have four CPUs each, and my I have a 8 GB RAM and 2 GB RAM each, even if I give a map task uh, which can handle 5 GB of 6 GB of data individually, it's it's only going to bottleneck the system. So a lot of times, first you have to understand your cloud strategy, your enterprise strategy, and then you build your big data strategy because they go hand in hand. Uh, how many concurrent hits you are getting? If you also have a mobile strategy and, and you are in a bad position that your big data strategy is so mature that it's also connected over there. A lot of people have not reached there, so uh, I think we are still evolving in, into that zone. So uh, I won't get into sharding and Mongo and I think a lot of things Manoj has shown. Uh, uh, so this is a bit deep for one session. Uh, logically, uh, having a EI infrastructure like a bus, mule, or a spring, or whatever layer you want to use, uh, using uh, Hadoop only for unstructured data processing, keeping your structured data processing still in your uh, Mongo, MySQL, whatever zone you are comfortable with, uh, having your reporting Jasper, Crystal, whatever is again comfortable and existing for the organization, is is a golden standard blueprint. I mean, we didn't do anything great in the project. Uh, we just followed the blueprint for uh, any good server application. So, sorry, one question. So, your model was predefined, as in you know, your reporting model. A reporting model was not predefined. Actually, we uh, learned uh, with new uh, because like skin was not skin uh, devices they didn't have. Then one of the uh, late doctor joined and she knew a costume company who has 50 lakh of equipment which can do a lot of skin based tests. So initially they started with uh, psychiatric tests, brain tests, uh, you know, heart tests, which were easier. Uh, you can do blood sample tests. So as soon as you get new tests, your report schema changes and, and you need to add a normalized data based on that data set. Okay, so that also, I, I asked that question because you said analysis is very easy. So. No, I'm not saying analysis is not easy. Uh, the point simply is that once you have these pieces, these are data objects which are moving on. So whether you are doing percolation or whether you call it something else, it's uh, the data objects which are uh, getting modified by each of these components. So if your component boundaries are well defined, which technology you use, whether you use Hadoop or you use Scala or Spark or you use uh, like you know R, Component will go get come and component will go out. So the system will the only problem you have to solve is scale and distribution. I mean that that's a tricky one. Well, I, in our experience, at least we are finding even to define a model is a tricky one. Okay. Uh, especially you know, and that's why I asked the question earlier whether you use sensor-based data or you use predefined. So in your case, you got data which you actually know and possibly know 80 percent of the model, but in some cases your question could be unambiguous. Could be asked a question that in this room, in, in this meeting room, um, you know, let's just gather all these statistics we can, and then let's figure out what did we learn. Right. As ambiguous as that, so then the whole process becomes even more interesting. Uh, definitely. But will if this is a hundred percent of your application, let's say you are getting data which is coming from uh, uh, your data acquisition is happening real time, right? And you don't know the schema. And your reporting is the piece which you you, you can't you, you don't have the schema. But is the blueprint or the architecture of the application it's going to change? No. Pretty much. Eighty percent or ninety percent of your application code will not change. Your ten percent of the code, which is the hardest one, may take two more time. But you know, as a software uh, architect, uh, maybe I will put more members or more parallel team over there to handle that problem. But I know my ninety percent of the problem. Is still well defined. So, uh, so challenges uh, in, in big data. I mean, uh, if you are using Hadoop, uh, the the versions keep on changing very fast. Uh, we we sh uh, shared that uh, last time. I mean, uh, the skill set availability in India for good Hadoop experts is, is very limited. Uh, you don't get people who have uh, strong experience in writing MapReduce tasks. Uh, <coughs> needs of I mean, this is uh, this was very. Uh, much needed in the last conference. I don't know whether this is uh, makes sense, but so I will uh, go to the next uh, use case, which which will cover your uh, first question. So uh, see, this is uh, a device which a person wears in hand, and this device uh, measures your activity data. 
So uh, all phones have an ectogram. So the intent is that uh, so this device is being manufactured by Stream Microelectronics for this project. And uh, the, the plan is uh, simply that uh, you know this uh, we we have put three sensors into this. And uh, just for sake of time, uh, the three sensors can measure the activity, uh, temperature, and the hemoglobin level, which are again five cents each, very cheap sensors. So overall cost of this watch is uh, $100, with all profits of 100, 100 times included. The current solution in market gets sold for $4,000, uh, coming from my last company. So uh, uh, not to you know say this is I'm I'm trying to compete or know the IP. I mean I, I came into this project purely because of government, and uh, I got to know uh, that this was also available uh, from Philips, and uh, we we found it very interesting that for Indian population uh, this makes a lot of sense. People can wear it, uh, and uh, the kind of data which will come is if you sleep at a given time every day in the night, uh, your sleep profile is very similar. It's, it's a three-dimensional data measurement because in the night you don't move that third dimension, so you get a clean signal. While for somebody who has stress or some other disorders, he will not have a very uh, uniform uh, breathing. So this is one sensor. Now, uh, th what data will have? Uh, light, no light, sleep, no sleep. There are a lot of things which will change. So our schema is not defined. We are only putting a platform and a corresponding acquisition layer and an analysis pipeline with the intent that once we go for a mass production, we will add more and more sensors to understand the missing pieces. So uh, our architecture is pretty much uh, you have a device and you can get the data from USB, Bluetooth or NFC, whatever format. Uh, that data in JSON uh, format and the reason of keeping JSON was because we don't know all the key value pairs right now, uh, will go into uh, Mongo and then it will be imported uh, by Hadoop uh, for processing and the reports will be generated based on the number of uh, sensors and, and the kind of things you have. So uh, I will go back just to the first slide for comparison. Uh, the reason of doing this is uh, simply uh, for number's sake, uh, you can uh, read for yourself what's the market size available in India. I mean, it's a, even if you sell for 5,000 rupees and it can help you identify when you're going to get sick uh, it's a $3 billion market, multiplied by 5,000 rupees. So, uh, so government is sponsoring this project. So, uh, hopefully this uh, will help me uh, build the biggest big data platform, uh, at least for this country. Uh, so, I'm already uh, involved in, in doing that for 10,000 people and, and this will give me a chance to get the real-time data where I can maybe then answer you uh, next time, showing that the schema is changing and we are able to solve the problem of finding new uh, decisions on top of it. No, I, I think, let me elaborate what I was saying. So I don't know if you're done. If you're done, I can ask sure. explain later. So, so basically, see, when the question is as ambiguous as, um, hey, so we're doing it. So Microsoft came to us and said, hey, we're doing, we want to get data about the attention span a user has on a particular application on mobile devices. Um, well, actually, their ask was even more ambiguous. They wanted some sort of, you know, um, you know, you, you know, the concept of second screen, as in you're watching TV and playing on your mm -hmm. mobile phone, etc. So they they were basically looking at a larger context study of user behavior when they are working on mobile devices as well as watching TV and what have you. So it's very ambiguous statement. All they want to figure out is which one is a mobile device, which one is not. How much for how much duration does a user use a you know um, application on a device? How much scrolling do they do on a mobile device? Is iPad Mini a mobile device or a you know normal size iPad a mobile device? Which one? How do you qualify all those things? So when you do that and you're trying to gather data, you're trying to gather the video recordings, you're trying to gather the pixel subtraction and what have you. You don't know what your model is going to be because you don't know what data it will come to. It's more experimental than you know predefined set of data model. In that case. What you're trying to do is that you're also running some unsupervised, you know, algorithms and trying to figure out, can I figure out any events? What are the insights? How do I start thinking about my model? So that was the point, because so in some I mean, cases your uh, statements can be, or problem statements can be very ambiguous. Problem statements can be very ambiguous and, and also, uh, you know, I mean, uh, frankly not to question uh, the problem statement. Sometimes problems can be made harder uh, when they are not. 
because we don't have the data which we need and we are trying to interpret data from what we have. Uh, like in, in uh, our case, you know, I come from Wisconsin from a group, uh, Dr. Julie Tononi, if you search, uh, he does a lot of uh, learning tasks and uh, the, the first product which got acquired was called Netscope. So we were trying to get the real-time brain data and we were trying to do something very similar but uh, our interest was not to look for mobile versus uh, computer. Uh, thing we were trying to, uh, so there are products uh, in the market called Smart Eye, Toby, which do, uh, you know, eye, uh, retina, uh, you can, pupil uh, things. So we use that actually. Okay, you use that, so good. So I'm, I'm speaking relevant things. And so you, you can have on your machine uh, uh, one camera or two cameras. Generally five cameras are better designed uh, three years ago. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you have uh, the camera, then you, uh, you know, register with your eye. And then you see where your eye is moving from this device to the mobile device, and you are getting that data. Then you are not, you don't have to come. I mean, if you don't have that data, there are other techniques like you know look at what time he is uh, you doing something on the mobile, uh, Facebook activity or some other activity on the phone versus the activity on the TV or on the on the this. Uh, ask some questions or quiz in the TV and and see whether his attention is over there. So. But if you have Toby data or Smart Eye data with you, and you have a real-time brain data, because uh, any uh, work which you do, there is always, in, in medical terms, it's called arithmetic stress or, or some things, GSR, GS, GCR. Your, as soon as you change your attention, your brain signal changes. So if you have that data, uh, your interpretation is direct. If you don't have that data and you are doing it from the social medium, from the mobile usage and all that, then you are interpreting because you don't have that variable available and, and you are kind of interpreting or interpolating data and interpolating data is always a tough problem because you don't know uh, the boundary conditions and you are doing that. I agree, I think we are digressing. So, yeah, so uh, yeah, that, that said, I think uh, that's all. Uh, uh, I mean, if, if anybody has any other question. No question? Or do I have a lot of time left? You wanted me to speak for more. <laughs> no, you don't. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I've answered a lot of questions. If anybody has any pressing question, or we can take it offline. So this uh, variable sensor thing, this is uh, uh, this is prototype right Right. Yeah, we have it prototype. So <coughs> the the uh, the watch came for twenty rupees from the far market. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The SG Microelectronics gave the uh, device for free for 1,000 pieces because they said we can't charge you for 10 cents. Right. So uh, I mean, if, if you are keen, uh, just send me a mail. I will send you pictures all of the device because it's hardly costing us 100 rupees. So we are already uh, uh, done it for uh, five uh, subjects. Uh, the I mean, one of my friends, uh, Hugo Faraguna, he is a professor in, in Italy. Uh, he actually. Uh, uh, he wears 10 bands on his hand from all different companies, Nextbit, Samsung, blah, blah. So when I started this project and I reached out to him, he said, uh, you know, I will give you all the data and algorithm which are available in the market because this is, he got uh, uh, some sleep disorder when he was young um, and uh, he went to Harvard. So he, this became his hobby. So he wanted to do this. So uh, fortunately for me, I got a lot of things for free from him. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, so if, if you guys are, it's, uh, if you're interested, uh, you, you can have a look at the kind of data analytics we are doing. And we are not doing anything rocket science. It's pretty simple, uh, plain, simple data. Is it available open source? Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Java developer, but not firm developer of open source that much. You know, I mean, I uh, generally work for cost money. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, if, if there's an interest, uh, we can give you one device, give you the code, uh, Frankly, it's it's uh, as long as it helps you uh, to to go on. It's not nothing I have done so far in my life is open source. It's always uh, for one company or the other. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's not the watch that you're wearing. That's the Swatch one, the very cheap one. <laughs> <laughs> Any others, or should we wrap it up? Thank you.
and uh, first up I am going to announce the quiz winner. Uh, actually, there are only two people who got one answer, right? <laughs> so, 